funny, she's smart, she craves chocolate every day, and she is the Greek goddess of coffee. Here is your host, Ellen Karras. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Karras' Comedy Corner. My name is Ellen Karras, and this is the guest edition of Karras' Comedy Corner. We have a fantastic guest today. I am so excited. Uh, but first, we have to thank our sponsors. Our first sponsor is Baywalk Marketing. Go to their website, baywalk.net, for all of your advertising and marketing needs. They can help you with any type of a flyer. They can help you with your social media. They can help you analyze the demographics of your business. They are fantastic. They're also experts in the Greek community. Go to their website, hollywoodgreeks.com, for all of your Greek entertainment needs, and hellenicfestivals.org to find out where there is a Greek festival near you. I'm telling you right now, nothing is going to stop the Greek from festivals and souvlakia and gyros and all that stuff that um, we love for you non-Greeks to eat. Uh, so go to their website, HellenicFestivals.org, because uh, the, the churches are getting ready to do their, their festivals this summer. No question about it. Also, our other... Um, our other sponsor is Select Flex. What is it? It's an orthotic. What's an orthotic? You, it, well, it's also called an insert, and you put it in your shoe. Why? Because you need it for your entire alignment, your ankles, your shins, your knees, your hips, your back, everything. It starts from the feet and it gives you support. If you are flat footed, if you pronate, these are the most, they're amazing. They're amazing. I've had the custom orthotics for hundreds and hundreds of dollars. These are just as good. And let me tell you what's so special about them. There is an adjustability in the arch and you can adjust the arch to firm, extra firm and extra, extra firm, depending on what your needs are. I do not uh, work out without them. I do not walk around New York City without them. If you stand on your feet all day, I'm telling you right now, go to their website, selectflex.com, S-E-L-E-C-T-F-L-E-X.com. And for Kara's Comedy Corner listeners, there's a 25% discount if you type in the code FAMILY25, F-A-M-I-L-Y-25, because I consider all you guys family. Uh, actually, I like you more than my family because we fight less. Uh, and they have a 30-second video. I'm telling you, check it out, check it out, selectflex.com. Okay, sorry I, I, uh, to my sponsors. I know I was, uh, it was not so smooth. Uh, I was on a plane. Can I use that as an excuse? It's, it's been a, over a year since I've been on a plane. So, I mean, it was only to Florida, not like I was going across time zones or anything, but uh, anyway, I'll, I use it as an excuse. Uh, so I'm very excited because I met this beautiful, talented woman uh, through a Facebook group, a newly formed Facebook group called, uh, I think I'm going to botch it up, so she'll correct me, but I, it's, it's uh, yeah, fabulous and over 50 or 50 and fabulous, 50 and fabulous. Um, uh, not that, you know, I'm fabulous or 50. Ha <laughs> uh, But anyway, um, anyway it was, it's a great group and you can join it also. Uh, you can Facebook friend me and I can I could get you in because I know people. Uh, started by uh, Elizabeth Browning, our guest, and uh, Sue Cassidy, who we had on last year, who was like a fan favorite. Uh, and um, you know, th these are the women I I admire, I look up to. They're doers. Okay, they get things done. They have vision. And they're so welcoming, and it just makes me proud to be a woman. So Elizabeth uh, is from Oklahoma, which Texas. I Texas. Oh, Texas, Texas. We're gonna have to find out about that. Moved to New York City, um, but she has an amazing career as an actress, an acting coach a personal transformation coach, which uh, I'm gonna ask what she's doing after the show and see if we can make an appointment so she can come here and transform uh, my husband and I. Uh, a, a director, a writer, uh, just she's done so much. And I just can't wait till we start asking her exactly how she got to where she got. So please welcome my guest without further ado, Elizabeth Browning. Oh my gosh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. You're welcome. And yes, uh, I went to college in Oklahoma, but I actually grew up in Texas. Oh, okay. That's well, totally okay. We think of it all as one big happy. It's, it, yeah, area. well, it's a, it's a lot of land. It's a, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so, um, well, what part of Texas? Dallas, Fort Worth. Oh, okay. That's, well, so that's, cos that's cosmopolitan. 
Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I actually had a really, I had the best of both worlds. Let me turn my phone off. It just reminded me. Um, I had the best of both worlds because I went to a Hotsi Totsi school in Dallas by day. And then I lived out in the country on a farm by night. So I got to hang out with like blue collar cowboys and rodeo guys. And then by day I went, so I sort of had a really diverse upbringing. So what, what do you think was um, some of the, the best things that you came away with growing up in you know, the, the, the Southwest like that? Oh my goodness. In the South, South, South Midwest sort of. Yeah. 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 What, what do you, what no, do you Texas think? is a world of its own. It really is. Um, well, I was really blessed because, um, and someday I think I'm going to make a movie about my mom mm. because she was, um, a woman, she was a doctor's wife, high society, Dallas, um, was doing the whole doctor's thing. And one day she was like, you know what? I need to follow my dream. And her dream was to uh, raise a world champion running horse. And she didn't know anything about horses. I mean, she'd seen them and she played with them. So she moved us out to the farm. She taught herself and she actually wound up with a world champion running horse. So I got to, yeah. So I got to live out on a ranch and I grew up with horses and um, and yet I still had my parents split up. And so I had truly the best of both worlds because I got to see how beautiful people are in, in totally different worlds. Uh, and I think it really did shape me. I think it really, it, and the courage of going after your dreams and doing what you want to do when everyone tells you that you can't and that it's never going to happen. Um, was a really powerful experience and it wasn't all easy and that will be in the movie you'll have to see how it happened but it was kind of an extraordinary story okay so clearly your parents weren't greek uh and, <laughs> and, um, but so because when you said that it's you when you said you had the best, best of both worlds there's a lot of characters in the in the city high society dallas life and then the whole ranch country thing did that have something to do with you wanting also to, to be an actress because you saw so many different types of people um you know that you know so many different personality types which wind up being characters right i mean each kind of each person oh yeah oh yeah well i mean at, at one point I was the, the all girl school I was going to by day when kids got upset and ran away from home in this school, they take their parents' credit card and like fly to Hawaii. <laughs> that's, that's a, I was the poor kid in a very, very exclusive school. And then at night we actually lived in a mobile home and we went to this, you know, little small country church and the people were so loving. And so, yes, from the time I was very young, I got to experience this wide range of people. And I guess, you know, if you wanted, if you said, well, what is it that made you want to be an actress? Here's the truth. I think I've always known that I was an actress. I think when we're little kids, we know. And then if we're lucky, we get to go on to do what it is that we know. And if not, we take like a long detour and hopefully at some point we come back to it. But I was the kid in grade school that was writing her own shows and casting herself as the lead and then putting everybody in a show. Um, and I knew three things. I knew that I loved everything, theater, film, television, music, anything creative. I loved it. I loved God and I loved being able to feel like I was someday going to make a difference. So that's kind of been my journey is I was going to bring the three of those things together and find a way, and it's taken me on a really long, interesting, all over the map um, journey. And yet all of it sort of has been guided by how can I use my art to inspire people, to open people's hearts to one another, to bring more hope and light into the world. And so that's sort of been my, my guiding light. 
so you seem to have been way beyond your years. Like you seem like you were an old soul when you were a little kid because kids are very in the moment, you know, and, and for you to be so in touch with that, you know, to feel like you want to make a difference um, is a very adult thing. So I, I, I mean, that's, that's in incredibly impressive that that. Well, I, I don't take credit for it. I don't know. It's like, I don't know where it came from, but I just, I loved what the theater could do. I loved acting because first of all, people think that acting is about faking and pretending that you're somebody else. And real acting is actually about opening to all of the facets of yourself and, and joining your truth with whoever the character's truth is. And what happens in my experience is that you can't judge any character that you play. As soon as you start to judge and you go, oh, I'm a really nice person, but this person's like really bitchy, then you can't play the role. So what you have to do is actually climb inside and start to see the world through a lot of different people's eyes and vantage points. And it's like, what would it be like if you grew up, you know, as a little girl in Texas, you know, um, or if I grew up in a Greek family or a role I once got to play a little Jewish girl in the Bronx during the depression. And in order to step into that, I got to expand into all of these different lifetimes with an open heart. And I think that's what I loved. And I do love about theater is that it's one of the few places left where the truth can still be told about who we are. And hopefully we can connect with each other through it. Yeah, you know, here in New York, as you know, uh, Broadway has been shut. Any live performance, live theater, comedy, I do stand-up comedy. Uh, and uh, I, it really, you know, aside from everything else that, you know, COVID brought with it, um, all of its darkness, uh, that definitely has been, I think it's hurt. Uh, yes, we, you know, we keep talking about the finance end of it and and, and you know this, and so I'll just mention it one I, you know, my background, my first background is as a CPA. So I, I always think of in a finance way. So as you were saying, you start, you always knew when you were a little girl, you might start out and then you detour. So that's me, that was, I'm in that category. But anyway, uh, but you know, we keep talking in New York City about the economic impact, which is, which is incredibly important, no question. But we never talk about um, the spiritual and uh, the art uh, and the value the art that that plays and live performances give us that experience. And you know what? Yeah, probably in the first couple months, the Netflix and the binge and the and the the bread, bacon bread. Well, I, mean, I didn't do any of that, but uh, you know, <laughs> I, did, I, I haven't still dusted my bedroom, and it's been a year. Um, and all this, you know, and all this, you know, these little activities and puzzles and whatever, which is great, which is great, but but. I, I think that, you know, that wears off very quickly. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, there, there are certainly many, many people that theater or live performances or you know, music, same thing, you know, jazz or whatever, concerts, all of that, you know, I'm putting all live performances in the same, kind of in the same category, because it moves you, you, you mm -hmm. like, you, say, you have an experience. Um, and that's why, you know, we're like with stand up comedy, <clears throat> I have watched people that I know, friends of mine that have had comedy specials and I'll be in bed, you know, I'll be watching and I'm like, do you know how much funnier they are in person? Like I realize that they're getting, a, you know, they're getting a good spot on Showtime or whatever. And that's great. And I'm happy, but they're so much funnier live. Like there's nothing like live. So Broadway theater, you can't watch it live. I understand sometimes they film things and they put them on PBS or whatever, and that's fine. And listen, if you live in the middle of nowhere and you can't go, it's the next best thing. But just to get to my point, um, we we don't talk enough about how people how it's hurt people, and they don't. I don't know if we all you know some people really realize it, but it, it hurts. It's hurt their their spirit, their motivation, their you know even your your brain. You know um, the thought process to. Um, uh, you know, of not having live performance, live theater, live, you know, whatever it is to, to, you know, to have that. 
Um, so we, we don't, I don't know how you measure it. I'm just saying, I just feel like we don't even really mention it. We keep talking about all of the lost revenues. Yeah, it's true. And, it, and you have human beings whose life is about that moment of communion with an audience or, or being on a set with a group of people and, cre- and co-creating something. And then people come and sit in the theater and they have a sense of togetherness. And I don't know, Stephen Colbert had this very funny segment with Laura Benanti, and I don't know if you saw it, but it's about the, the, the struggles of living with uh, an actor during COVID. <laughs> I won't I won't spoil it, but it's really funny because it's like, how do they keep the flame alive? How do they remember what it is that they do and, and how do they give what they have to give under these circumstances? And it's kind of a big question. Yeah, yeah. So, no, I mean, I, I, I just think that's wonderful that that was always your MO, uh, uh, you know, about creating and, and storytelling. And I think that that's important. Um, so you, you, from a very early age, you packed it up and came to New York and you went I to- actually, I actually, I mean, I went through school and when I got out of school, um, <laughs> I got in to, I got into NYU School of the Arts. I was there for a year. And then my mother had this, bizarre accident um she was trampled by a 1600 pound bull in texas oh my god and she had a a ranch with 60 horses at this point so my boyfriend who was then to become my husband we moved to texas for a year and while we were in texas um we got a call and we were invited to come and help start a new theater company in new york city which was oh my god it was like we did that for 10 years. I call it the Camelot years because it was a beautiful company. We did a lot of amazing shows. We started a school um, and I learned along the way that I also really loved teaching and helping people figure out how to get to where it was that they wanted to go. And then I sort of fell into teaching and I taught at NYU's um, uh, Circle in the Square, I can say it. NYU Circle in the Square, and uh, and then I started my own studio, and I started working with professional actors on Broadway and film and television, and then other people started finding the studio who were not professional actors, but they had a sense that they wanted to step into a different kind of role for themselves in their life, and they wanted to become more expressive. So I, it, the studio started to expand, so I have like my track for professional actors. And then I also have uh, a track for people, lawyers, business people who said, I know there's more within me and I'm not expressing it. So, um, so I've been teaching and along the way, my real dream, if I was going to take you over to my treasure box and open it, I have always wanted to have an inspirational film and television production company. Where, and when I say inspirational, it doesn't mean that we don't do dark pieces. It doesn't mean that we don't shake people up. It doesn't mean that we don't do crazy off the charts comedy. But the goal is that when it's all said and done, we feel our hearts open a little more. We, we feel a little kinder and more compassionate toward one another. We've maybe awakened. And so um, when I was 55, I said, okay, you either need to do it or you need to stop talking about it. Because I, I did everything that I was an actress, I, I directed, but I wasn't doing the film. So at 55, I made my first film and it was a miracle project. Um, and every step of it was so incredibly delicious. Um, and that's the jumping off place of future projects. So. So, it, so let's just go back for a second. So the your production company is Joy Light. Is that Joy, Joy Light Production? Low Joy Light Production. Mm-hmm. What was your studio called when you came to the? My studio is actually the Elizabeth Browning Studio. So I I have Elizabeth Browning Studio. I have Joy Light Productions, and um, yes, I'm the president of both. And my husband goes. I'm the vice president and janitor. <laughs> <laughs> hey, somebody has to be. Um, That's right. <laughs> Clorox wipes don't buy themselves. Um, so 
did and your is your husband in in performing as well or is he, he is a, he's he, a he's a, a wonderful wonderful actor civilian um, as i say but no but my so yours he's an actor okay yeah he's an actor uh we're a big arts family uh when we had kids and we moved out of the city he started a music together program which is like um music early childhood music mm -hmm. and so every day he puts on bunny ears and sings and all these he's like the mayor of kids under the age of five everybody loves him and he continued to do some performing and I'm like you know what it's time to come back because he's really wonderful and then we had a son uh who's now 24 and my daughter is about to turn 20 on uh Friday which is so hard to believe and my son graduated from SUNY Purchase in playwriting, screenwriting, and now he has created this gorgeous new musical that I'm uh, helping produce that we're hoping will find its way ultimately to Broadway. So there's lots of juicy, arty stuff happening with us. So how do you keep it together? Because I've lived two lives. I lived a life of a, an accountant. I worked on Wall Street also. So I got a paycheck. I got a bonus. I had health care, you know, consistent. I pretty much knew I got promoted. You know, it was it was what it was. I'm not saying it wasn't, you know, easy and it was without its challenges and it's a lot of learning and it's, you know, a lot of brain power, different brain power, a um, lot of, you know, to client interface, you know, it's, it's a lot of a lot of things, but, you know, business, money, and people, that's everybody's priority. Um, and I now I live and I've now lived a, a long time in the comedy artist, I have no idea when my next gig is coming from I uh, it's you know, uh, this month, I made x next month, I might make zero. <laughs> so <laughs> all of that. Uh, and, and although, although I will, you know, just, I have a husband, so I, I can't say I'm doing this all by myself, which would be a whole nother thing. So I don't want to say that um, that has not helped because obviously it has. However, I still want to, you know, earn money and, do, you know, do all those things. And, and you know, I, I look at it as on my own entity. But um, so, but in your case, you've only been in the art world and you managed, you know, you got married, of course, to somebody like-minded and you have children and you, you managed to raise a family. I mean, it's hard. Like we don't have any children. You know, we, we always live within our means, you know, all that kind of stuff. So how did you do it? How did you keep it together? And, and you, and you know, and, and now, like, your kids are, now your kids are grown where, when they were, uh, you know, for whatever, six, the first 16 years, uh, you know, it, it changes, but you know, from one to 10, they really need you, you know, you know, oh, yeah. And, yeah. Then, and then on and on. So like, how, how did you do all that? That's a, it's actually a really great question. I'm looking and going, how did we do that? Like, <laughs> I don't know. How did we do that? Um, well, I have to say we we did live a lot by faith in terms of somehow if we do this, somehow this is going to work out somehow. But um, uh, my teaching was pretty solid source of income. And then seven years ago, um, I met Sue Cassidy, who you talked about at the beginning of the show, mm -hmm. and she was a national vice president with Arbon International. Mm -hmm. And I heard her talk about being an artist and also being able to have all of these other um, sources of earning. And she was writing a musical. She's been working on a musical and she has this online wellness business. So I joined that business and I've been building that business. So that's been another stream of support for us. Mm -hmm. You know, I, it, it hasn't carried us by itself, but it's certainly. And then, um, it, then individual projects would show up. So like this past summer, um, I got to direct a show in Florida over Zoom. And it was amazing. 
And it was a show that she um, was scheduled to develop for theaters and then everything shut down. And she said, could I do it on Zoom? And they were like, if you think you can. So I directed, we've never met in person. We got intimately close over Zoom. She would set me up in the corner of her living room and we set up the living room like a black box theater. Her son, not her son, I'm sorry, her husband built like curtains so that it actually looked like a little miniature black box theater. We staged it, he filmed it. And um, that was like a, a great support for three months. And I have to say she wound up winning the um, 2020 Broadway World Regional Awards for play production of a play of the decade and performance of the decade. And she did it in her living room in her little makeshift black box theater. And I was like, you know, on, I was like in the corner on Zoom going, no, wait, you gotta reshoot that. So I think where there's a will, there is a way. And when you least expect it, something new shows up. And, um, and then my husband has had his music together business, which has been a godsend. Um, and, and he worked in other places. And we sort of just took turns because we knew that we, we didn't want to work all the time to have somebody else raise the kids. So we sort of traded off. Um, and then my mother came to live with, with us for the last 18 years. So that was another, um, but she had a certain source of income. So it was kind of like things show up when they need to show up. So, and I'm, yes, it's hard. Yes. It's, I'm not saying it's not hard. I'm not right, saying. Right. Um, but I mean, you know, to do it is, <laughs> you know, knowing the, you know, the, the inconsistency, the never knowing the next day things get canceled. You might think you have this big project or I mean, how many gigs <laughs> canceled on me because of COVID. Yeah. Oh yeah. It could be anything. Um, but you know, I've had gigs postponed for other reasons, obviously, uh, is, is huge. I don't want to gloss over this, but, uh, before you, when you talked about the three things that inspired you, you said that your faith in God and, um, what do you, what are you a specific religion or are you just faithful? Or, I mean, I know you're from the South, so I'm assuming, uh, there, I, there's a lot of Baptists now. Just bear with me, okay? I am a New York Greek, which means I think everybody's either Italian, Spanish, <laughs> Puerto Rican, Greek, Jewish. You know what I mean? So I, I, I am a little myopic still, and even in my big adult life, um, when it comes to all these different religions, like I'll, like I'll be at a Greek show and I'll point to somebody and they'll, they'll, you know, be married to a Greek, and I'm like, what are you? And they're like Lutheran, and I'm like, I have no idea what that is, but that sounds <laughs> right. I, I Good for you. And I'm like, but I've been to your church and you have nothing on the wall. That's what I, that's what I know. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you could spit for an icon maybe or a cross. I don't know. But anyway, so what, so was it that, was it, was it a Bible-based church or, or is it just your own? You know, I love that you asked me this question and, and I'm like, yay. <laughs> um, I actually didn't grow up with any religion. Mm -hmm. uh, my mother used to say, Oh, girls, look at the beautiful world that God has made for us. Isn't it glorious? So my first experience of God was like, God's definitely an artist. God <laughs> loves beauty. Everything is like really wonderful and rich. And then when I became, I don't know, 11, 12, I started like wanting to know God and I didn't know how. And I remember my 13th on Christmas Eve when I was 13, I literally went out into the field and I laid on the ground and I was like holding onto the grass. And I was like, is this you? Like, how do I, where are you? Like, how do I know you? And so when I was 15, because I was in Texas, yes, I went to a little Southern Baptist church way out in the country. I hadn't, I didn't know what to expect. My sister and I had like been in church on Easter Sunday and played tic-tac-toe on the back, but it wasn't. And, um, and that was where I heard that you can have a relationship with God by asking Christ to come into your life. And I was like, sign me up. And, and as soon as I tell people I'm a Christian, it's really sad. But then I go, but I'm not one of the scary Christians. It's like, I'm really sorry to say this, but the, my faith when I was starting 
I understood Christianity and Christ to be the lessons are to love each other, to not judge one another, Correct. to that we're here to heal. And I, and the people that sort of took care of me and raised me, they walked their talk, they took care of each other. So, and I actually, by the time I was 18, um, <laughs> I was, I auditioned for a, at first I thought I was going to be a Christian dramatist because it sounded good, but I had no idea what it meant. So I went to like the most grueling audition I've ever been in, in my life to this day. It was like a three day audition in this big conference center. And we had to go through all these, these exercises with people like taking notes. They were going to put together this group. And um, at the end we had a talent night and we were each supposed to do our talent. So I wrote a monologue on all of the bad advertisement that Jesus gets. And it was funny. And it was, you know, like all the things that are not what I understood. And I thought it was brilliant because at the end of the monologue, you turn off the TV because you're about to turn it off and you can't stand the commercials. And then the program itself comes on the air and it's Jesus himself. I thought, oh my God, I'm going to be on this tour. I got in so much trouble. <laughs> it was, people were like, how dare you make fun of so I was like, all right, that's not going to be my path. It'll be a personal journey. I've been Methodist. I've been Baptist. I've gone to Catholic churches. It's like any place where people love God and love Christ and love each other and really do what makes sense. I feel comfortable there. And so that's sort of my faith. It's right now I'm going to a little Methodist church, but it's not a, it's, it's, it's a personal love best relationship that's really what my journey is and that's it's been a long time even being able to speak about it I've been sort of closeted in the shadows because as soon as people go whoa run <laughs> run away and so uh, I'm glad you asked because I got to find a way to actually really share what my truth is and how I see the world, because we got to stop hurting each other. We have to start taking care of each other. So um, uh, you're welcome at the Greek Orthodox Church. If you haven't experienced, if you haven't come. Um, I have not. I have not been to a Greek Orthodox Church. I'd be more than happy to take you. Not that we, uh, we're not a cult. <laughs> we're, not a, we're not a cult. Uh, I, I know exactly. I know exactly what you mean. Uh, and I mean, for, for me, it's, you know, I, I'm sure you've met Greek people, you know, it's- I like, love Greek people. I culture, love Greek people. It's a cultural thing. It's part of who we are. It's like, you can't really be Greek without being Greek Orthodox. I mean, I, you know, it's, it's, it's all part, part of it. But <clears throat> I absolutely know what you're saying. And let me remind anybody that is making a judgment. Um, we live in America still, and we have freedom of religion. And I can be whatever religion I want, and you can be whatever religion you want, or feel or not feel, or whatever. I'm not judging. It's 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 your journey, not mine. I completely agree. I can't stand the uh, the, the bad PR. Um, and <clears throat> you know, when people commit violence under the guise of Christ and they're not it's out they're out of the club okay they're not they're yeah not, I agree they're out of the club they need help there it's not like that at all I, and it, you know it's like look Elizabeth it's like everything you know it's just and I'll just use this as an example um you know if somebody from a, a, a particular ethnic group or race does something you don't judge everybody. No, exactly. That's it. Exactly. And the story. You know, it's like, I don't know how many more years we need on this planet to like get that message. I mean, we're, I in, know. we're in 2021. 2021. Not 1921. <laughs> not 1821. Yeah. We're yeah. in 2021. Okay. We've had all kinds of studies analysis evolution science technology all this stuff and it's like sometimes i'm like nothing's changed so i not to get off the subject but i completely agree and i've definitely over the years especially more as a as an artist 
you know, when it's come up um, because actors come in all different shapes and sizes. And listen, you're an atheist, you're an agnostic, you know, people like try to argue and whatever. I, I'm not here to argue. I, it's, it's cool. You, you want to believe in nothing or this or this just happened exactly. uh, by, uh, you know, just by accident. That's, that's fine. I don't buy it. I don't buy it. <laughs> and that's it. Don't argue with me. Um, so <laughs> I, I don't have patience for it anymore. And, it, and it's, and again, like, again, it's like this judgment. It's like, you, you don't know. And, and the other thing, the other problem too, is because everything is political. Every, oh, everything that comes out of your I mouth know. has to be attached to a party, a this, and I want to start my own party, the I don't give a shit party. Like, I, it's like <laughs> just be a good, be, how about this? Be a good person. It's not that hard. Ten Commandments, you know, still applies today. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Thou shalt not yeah. kill. You know what I mean? Um, uh, 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 you know, be a good person, you know, you, you know, if you can take care of yourself, obviously, you know, if you need help, that's a whole nother thing. We should all be able to, God helps those who help themselves. We should also be able to take care of those. You know what I mean? Just be good. Don't cheat. Don't cheat on your spouse. You know, so like, it's just like basic, basic rules. And, and it's just, I don't, I don't, you know, like, I don't get it, but I know. And I, and it's, it's, uh, again, so it's attached to like, oh, well, you must be a this supporter or that's No, you know, I know. No. You have no idea how, again, where I stand. Uh, exactly. Who I voted for. Not that it's any of your business anyway, you know, right. by the, oh, by the way. Right. <laughs> you know? so, right. So it, I get it. It gets a little, it gets a little frustrating. Uh, it gets a lot of, you know, depending on also where you are and whatever, but I've been in that judgy place too. And it's just like, Oh no, I think we all have. It's, it's like, it's interesting because this is the period we're talking during Lent. Right. Right. And I'm not Catholic, but I always like the idea of Lent. Like if I like something, I'm like, I like that idea. So I was like, okay, what am I going to give up? And I was already like on this cleanse and I'd already given up sugar. And I thought, Ooh, this year, and this is a kicker if you try it, but it's amazing. I said, I'm going to give up judging. Mm -hmm. I'm going to see what it's like to just commit for 40 days to really not judge other people, to not judge myself, to not. And it's so like challenging because you're like, oh, no, no, no. But it's like, oh, no, wait, I'm not doing that for 40 days. And there's this freedom that comes with it where you're like, what if we didn't have to judge each other and we didn't have to judge ourselves and we sort of work from a different place so um it's an interesting experiment i cannot say that i have been successful but just the practice of it because we're so harsh with ourselves and we're so harsh with everyone else and i think there's a much gentler guideline that we could live by but it's like well you go first <laughs> You go first and then I'll do it. Yeah, well, the, the let me just say something about Lent because our Lent is um, the fast that we do as Greek Orthodox that you're supposed to do is like a vegan fast. You're not supposed to eat any animal products. And I, I will say, you know, as time has gone on, there's so many more vegan you know, uh, 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 excuse me, choices. My grandmother and great grandmother, you know, used to make beans and, you know, I would take, uh, cause I went to Greek parochial school, peanut butter and jelly, like we all ate peanut butter and jelly for 40 days. I mean, it was just, <laughs> you know, no milk. Um, so, so, uh, so I, I'm doing that, uh, but it, interesting that you said, and I gave up chocolate because I, I love chocolate more than I love my husband. I got to be honest with you. Uh, and and he knows it. <laughs> I moan and groan more when I eat chocolate. And um, I know that wasn't very Christian, but I said it anyway. Uh, and that's but, how it is. <laughs> that's the truth. Uh, but um, what, but I, and, and our, we, we have some really great priests with some really great and and I remember years ago one of the priests said you know and because we're Greek we focus on the food and what are we going to eat and we complain and all this stuff he goes but don't forget it's also not not necessarily what you put in your mouth what comes out of your mouth mm. so, so Lent is a, a great thing for everybody you know exactly. what is that? renewal refresh rebirth and um, so so I also make other Lenten goals I, I, you know, I want to read some more books, this, that, but this one, and so, so far so good, uh, is about uh, being calm. 
and oh and having, i love that and having patience although the first night I, I yelled at my niece but then i apologized uh but uh but being patient and calm because I, I i really find i get very short-circuited sometimes and it's just uh not good it's not good for everybody so that so that's my thing so i think that that's great and and i think lent is a great to, to you know time to do that um listen i think i love what you said uh about christ i love christ um i pray every day uh, again i'm not looking to convert anybody or anything i and i've had my journey because I grew up in the Greek Orthodox Church. Yeah. It was like, it was 24 seven. Our whole life was at like my, the Girl Scouts was there. Our ballet class was at the school. Like everything was at the school. And, um, and then I went to a public high school and I was the only Greek kid. Oh, they, wow. Like, they didn't even know what Greek was. Like, it was so weird. It was like, is that Italian? It's like, no, Greece, it's a country. Where was that? Greece. Was that? In uh, upstate. And not upstate, well, in Rockland, in Rockland. Um, it's not really upstate. And um, so, but I wanted to be Italian. And, you know, I wanted to be Catholic, like my Catholic friends. And, you know, their mass was only half an hour. And, you know, they didn't have all these Greek stuff and you know, whatever. So I went through my thing. But I have to say about... 15 years ago or so, I, uh, well, two things happened. One is I started to do comedy at Greek churches. And I, oh. you know, all of a sudden I was like around more of my people. And, um, and I just, but I did, I felt like I was making bad, some bad choices and I felt like something was missing. And mm. I remember my mother saying to me, you know, you, you know, you don't have to go every Sunday. You can go once a month. You can go. And, and, and it so happened that, um, when I kind of had this, you know, like something's missing in my life. I'm not making good choices. I'm not setting any boundaries for myself. Uh, I went and it was, um, it was approaching Lent. And I was like, you know what, this is a great opportunity. And I kind of went through the Lenten period. And then I went Holy Week. They had services every day. They have like three times a day, you know, and I got my book and I went and it really helped me. And, uh, and then eventually when my, after my sister had her kids, my niece who's um, godmother for when she was three or three and a half, I took her to Sunday school and then I wound up helping. And so I've been a Sunday school teacher for 12 years. To make a long oh, story. I love that. So I got very, I very involved. That. And you know what? I learned more about the saints and um, the Bible because I became a Sunday school teacher. Oh yeah, I think when you teach, whatever you teach, you get better. I know I'm a much, much better actress because I've been teaching acting for 30 some years. And when you can't teach something and not know it better, it's like, if you wanna get better at something, teach it to someone, like yeah. offer it. I love that story too. And I think, I think for us to have the freedom to say, this is where my heart is. This is where I live. And I will let you have your heart and live where you live. And what would it look like if people didn't have to hide out from one another? You know, people could say, yes, I love, I went to a Seder on Saturday, a, a Jewish Seder, and I actually got to read in it. And it was so moving to me. It was so beautiful. And, you know, for anybody who's searching or have or has found what they're looking for, but scared. We need to just be kind and let each other be who we are. I think it would be so much easier, so yep. much easier. So, yep, yep, yep. So, uh, so um, uh, gosh, I, I, this is a topic I could talk about for hours. Me and hours. too. I'm like, hours and hours. Ask me about my faith. Hey, three hours later, we're still talking. So I think I think that that is really uh, awesome. So I love that you um, you know you, you know you taught acting, but then how you created this other business for yourself um, for people that were not lawyers, you know, not looking to go into acting necessarily but wanted to really, I guess, tap into their artistic heart, which is really what happened to me. Although I got to tell you, when I got that taste, I just knew like I had, this was, I was going to do this. I don't know how I was going to do it. And the comedy came a few years after when I was studying. Let me just tell you the power of teachers. I would love that. You're very good, by the way. You are very funny. You oh, are thank very you. Thank funny. You. I, I, thank you. Thank you. I, I, it's, you know, it, you know, it takes a long time to find your voice and all that and all that stuff. But thank you. And I love to do it too. And it really is a passion. Um, uh, 
a few years into it, I, I wanted to study with an acting teacher. Her name is Penny Templeton. I don't know if you've ever heard of her. And I've heard of her. I don't know her, but I've heard of her. And we would improv something from our lives uh, <clears throat> in the beginning of class, whatever it was, you know, we get up and just that's how, you know, like it was a warm up, obviously. And I would always improv. My sister was getting married and it was like, it was crazy. It was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> So, so uh, I would do that. And anyway, so afterwards she goes to me, I have two notes for you. One is that you should write a one woman show on your sister's Greek wedding. And it was before Big Fat Greek Wedding. And I go, oh, who's gonna wanna see that, right? And uh, <laughs> you know, I have vision. And, uh, and then the second thing she said to me was, uh, I hope you talk about your Greek family in your stand up." And I go, mm. I don't do stand up." And she goes, I'll never forget. And this is what she said. She goes, get some. And that was my one, I get the chills talking about it. And I, I got in the, said so later on that night, I got in the cab, I was living on the West side at the time. And I remember looking out in the cab and I'm like, okay, I want to be on a sitcom. That was my goal. Right? I grew up watching sitcoms, all, all of them. That was my babysitter. That was my friend. And, uh, and I said, well, at the time, Seinfeld, Ray Romano, Brett Butler, Roseanne, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I said, I can become a stand up and then, uh, you know, and then someone will see me and whatever and the whole thing. And I went to the comic strip and I took a class, which was wound up being just me. And his name is DF. We, he's, he's a comic, you know, I know him now, of course. And, um, and I'll never forget first time I got on stage, you know, you write your two minutes and stuff. And DF actually, he was really great because he had said to me, I want you to write clean because you can always make clean dirty. You can't mm. get dirty clean. And it was one of the, I thought one of the best, not that I was ever looking to be like gross and raunchy, <laughs> but you know what I'm saying. Uh, so it was just great advice. Anyway, that's how my journey. So teachers, that was Penny. It wasn't even in my, my head at all, not my thought process at all. So it's just so interesting how anybody, somebody, you know, but here's, you know, being a teacher, you're a teacher can really influence your life. I mean, it changed my entire life. Yeah. Um, and just last week was the weirdest thing. Uh, we became Facebook friends a few years ago. And I, I remember like kind of writing her a note. She just wrote me a note last week. I haven't talked to her in forever years. And she, and right, I'll paraphrase, but I'm so proud of you. She goes, I was teaching a master class last week on Greek theater and I and I told told them the story about you and I see and doing it and this and that. I was gonna cry. I'm like, Penny, I love you. You changed my life. I love you. And um, so you know, th this is like you, I, I get this, I am sure of it. I'm sure I'm sure of you. This is like I get that essence from you as well. We just want to be because this trip is short. <laughs> It's so true. It's a blip. It's so true. You know, and and um, and so I think I love what you're. You know, you're 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 you clearly have touched so many people, mm -hmm. and I just think that that's you know that's great. You took this gift. I mean, again, you. You, you, again, your you know your soul. You have like such a rich, a rich soul. So I I, I think that's great. Have any of the the uh, sort of like the people that didn't set out to be actors or actresses, did they decide after they were with you? Did anybody decide to uh, pursue it a little bit more or? Oh yeah, I mean, I mean, I've worked, they, in the beginning, they would come in and be in the class with the professional people that were like working on Broadway and, and they felt like, I, I mean, a lot of, I, I think most of the people secretly wanted there was a lawyer. I, I honestly think most lawyers really want to be actors, but they want to make money. <laughs> <laughs> that is hilarious. <laughs> you know, it's like, but, but, you know, uh, oh, yeah. and I've had some amazing lawyers who've come in, um, who've used it as a place for self-expression, but there was a lawyer and shortly after pursuing his dream for a year or two, I think he left law and he started acting and then he became a, an MC and something and it's it's and I'm sure there are other people I'm not thinking instantly of somebody who's come to mind um and there have been people who've come in that literally you would from the outside people would go oh dear 
oh dear, this is not for you. Someone would say, this is not for you. And if you want it and you are willing to like roll up your sleeves and say, I'm willing to let go of any of the false beliefs and the way I thought I had to be, I've seen people transform into amazing actors from very frightened, shut down, shy, mumbly. Um, and so I also am not a believer to say you either have it or you don't. I think we all have it because we're human beings. And it's just a matter of how fully human can you allow yourself to be and how far are you willing to go? And you may not wind up on Broadway, but you can always live some portion of your dream if you give yourself permission to do it. And I think so many of us, like I totally see you in your own sitcom. I just want you to know that. Oh, <laughs> totally see you in your own sitcom based on who you are. And you're one of the, the special gifted beings because you both sides of your brain are firing. Like you could do math and you can do creative and you're funny. And that's not anything to take for granted. Believe me, I still have nightmares that I have a math test that I still have to go back and do. <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, but, and, and I have to say the, the working actors that have done very, that are, you know, names, they also, people go, oh, well, they're big names, you know, they, they've got it set. But everybody has some place left to go that they want to go or something left to do that they want to do. And you're right. This is a very short trip. And at some point, um, I have a, an online um, new talk show mm. called Inspiring Life with Elizabeth. Mm. It's on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And last Wednesday, I, would, uh, I interviewed an author and a novelist. Um, who's written a novel, but it also talks about um, life and how it applies the, the author's toolkit. And she said, in any novel, when you're writing, you write, you write, you write, and then you go to page 50 and you look at the first 49 pages and you go, do I really need these? And what out of this? Because it takes like 49 pages to figure out what your story's really going to be, to figure out you know, what it is you really, the story you want to tell. And a lot of times you cut a lot of way. And she said, it's the same in life. And I believe that. I think it takes us up to 50. We're grappling, we're struggling. We've got the dramas. We put our importance on things that we wish we hadn't. But along the way, we start to go, oh, maybe this is who I am. This is my story. This is. And so at any point, and the, the group, by the way, it's forever fabulous. <laughs> Yes, I'm Forever sorry. fabulous, <laughs> 50s and beyond. It's in Facebook. And if you're over 50, because I, I love that it takes a while to figure out what you want to do and who you want to be. Even if you were a child star, you know, and I do, I work with award-winning actors that are going, I don't know if I keep, want to keep doing this. Maybe there's something else. Mm -hmm. and, and so I guess the other thing I wanted to be sure to say is, during the pandemic and beyond, I think the best thing to do is to clear your space energetically. I have this exercise where I lead people and you pick up all of the expectations and you throw them out the window and you let out sound. You pick up the judgments people put on you, throw them out the window and you let out sound. Everything you do is physical, vocal. And then you literally clear the space and you plant seeds in your new garden. And one hand is chuck it seeds, if I'm PG correct, but a lot of my actors love fuck it seeds, meaning whatever happens, however this goes, whatever anybody says with a big smile, fuck it, mm -hmm. chuck it. And then the other hand, you, you spread you. So you would have Ellen, and I would say Elizabeth, and you make a space that's yours. And then we use water and it says, anything is possible, everything is okay. And you start to create space because if anything were possible and if everything were okay, which you can make it so for little periods of time, what would you create? What would you make? What would you do? Mm -hmm. And it might be the first step is let me learn something new that I haven't learned yet. Or it might be, I'm gonna start writing 
or it might be, I've had to show in my heart and I didn't, and I've been waiting, but we give our power away to everybody else and wait for somebody to come touch us on the head and say, now you're hired, now you're chosen. And in the meantime, we like give our own power away. So I'm a big advocate of saying, start where you're at and create just for the fun of it, for the love of it and see what happens. Because I believe when we are lit up and we are fully alive, that's when amazing works of art get made that you never would have known. So I got, I got on a soapbox, but I wanted to be able to share that because it feels we're all like, oh my God, we can't do anything. We're stuck. Where's the next paycheck going to come from? And we start acting because we love it. And then we get lost in the business and the money and the finances, just like you said. And it's like, wait a minute, maybe this is a chance for me to return to my heart and to my soul and what I love about this. And just for a while, put all the the pressures of the business to the side because they'll still be there, but we can kind of redefine who we are in the process. Wow, you really are very inspirational. And that, um, uh, you know, that makes so much sense. I mean, I think to be around somebody like you, you know, constant, I mean, I don't want to call you a therapist, but you're sort of like a creative therapist, you know, because you keep it plugged in. Um, you know, you can keep people plugged in, which I, which and you know what creativity is therapeutic. That's I believe that when we are creating, even if you're painting a room or you're making a beautiful tray of food, something yeah. happens within us. And it's like a fountain of youth. And we, and we forget that it's our creativity that excites us. And that's why we go to the theater and cry when somebody gets on stage and rages on our behalf or acts silly on our behalf. Because in that moment, we're all like co-creating. So I do, I think creativity can bring us back to what it is we really want to do. And it'll only make us better as actors or directors or writers. So it in what you said, so uh, someone like myself, and, and this is probably a very common example, I've got, you know, 75 ideas. I have uh, something that I started, which was a play about my great grandmother that I absolutely want to do. I started during, you know, when this, when the first lockdown first happened, I'm like, I'm going to write this play. I got some stuff done down. I had taken a class four years ago, a writing class, you know, I can't seem to get myself to really get it all together. You know, my, my goal was to get it to like 10 minutes, you know, and do like a 10 minute read and, a you know, because obviously plays take a long time to get on their feet. And then at some point, get it into a little black box space and, you know, you know, do something like that. And I, everything though, I can, 27 interruption. Oh, I got to do this. I got to go to the bank statement. I got to blah, blah, blah. I got to do the taxes. I got, you know, I, it's like, it's, and the thing is, I, I say to myself, sometimes I stop and I go, do you want to do this? Or do you not want to, if you don't want to do this, then let it go, you know? But it's like, but no, I want to do this. I want to do this for like a million reasons, a million reasons. Um, so, and then I had this pilot TV show idea. And then and then I've got all my stand up and the 9 million notes. And I'm like, I really want to organize this. I've got, I've got, you know, documents that say new jokes all over the place, you know, all that kind of stuff, right? So, and I, I've got to imagine, I, clearly I'm not the only one and this could be oh for, my gosh you're so not the only and one this could be for anything not just in acting but just in you know people have all kinds of ideas businesses and because you know you you you, you stretch the gamut here so what would be just some some quick tips or some easy things that you can you can uh, you know give people that you think can get them to prepare so yeah, so I always, I, I highly, if anybody wants, I don't know how people contact you, but if anybody wants the PDF that breaks down my clearing the space exercise, I'm happy mm -hmm. to send it because there is something about claiming space for yourself and saying for the next 15 minutes, for the next half hour, I'm gonna clear this space and this is gonna be my play space just to play. 
Um, and it's an exercise that you literally can do every day. And it actually starts to like expand the possibilities because it gets you out of your mind. Then here's what I think. I think that we need each other. I think unless you are born as a writer and you do best when you go into a room and you like these things pour out on the page, you're an actress, you're a performer. I'm an actress. It's like for us to sit and write, the mind starts to edit and things start to get weighed down. And then you're like, and you've got pages. And then you're like, I surrender. And it's just really hard when you're trying to do it by yourself. So one of the things that anybody can do is find a partner or find somebody who loves you, who's going to be a positive mirror and say, I want to take 15 minutes and then you take 15 minutes. The beauty of Zoom is we can record anything and it can be total baloney and we can just erase it. But say, I want to tell you a story that I have in my head that I think may be something that I'd like to put on stage because the way you tell the story, there are going to be moments that go, oh, that's really what it's about. Then you can go back. You can either transcribe it or you can go to Fiverr and for very little money, have somebody else transcribe it. And then your script begins to emerge out of you telling the story that you want to tell and you bounce off of each other because we, it's hard. Actors are like, I'm so depressed because I can't make myself read plays every day or practice my monologues. I'm like, of course it's depressing because <laughs> we don't do it so we can hear ourselves make noise. So if there's a, or create a collaborative or talk, put your teddy bear and turn on the recording machine and see what happens. But I think if you get out of your head and if you say, and also I think it's a mistake to say, oh, just pick one thing and only do that. Because if you're like me, I'm like, no, I can't do just one thing. But it's like, do this. And while you're doing it, just do that. And then bless it, put it to the side and then do this. So you can do two things because really it's the rules that kill us. The mm -hmm. self-imposed rules that we think, well, it has to be done this way. It has to be done that way. And then the last thing that my friend Lynn Jordan has been working on that I'm fascinated with, fascinated and I know this is going to sound like this has nothing to do with what we're talking about, but it's changing everything for me. She decided several years ago that she was going to go on a year where she was completely committed to falling madly in love with herself. And she said, I pretended to be my best boyfriend, my best husband, my best friend. And I would say for performers, your most loving agent, your best director and she would like go to bed at night going, oh my God, you were amazing today. Do you know how beautiful you are? What would you like to do? And she'd wake up and what happened was we're like little kids. Artists are like little kids. And if they take three steps and they fall down and you go, that's not walking. What was that? Oh my God, everybody's running, get up. The little kid just goes, Ugh. but if the little kid takes three steps and you go, three steps you did three steps then it's like i can do five steps and so as artists especially right now i think we need to cut ourselves a lot of slack and not even artists we're all artists in some way you're an artist if you're a mom you're an artist if you're an accountant and you're creating but to cut yourself a lot of slack to do a little falling in love with yourself and say, what would make you happy? What would delight you? And start with what lights you up because the creative energies will start to go, oh my God, this is like being a little kid and playing in the backyard. And this is when I was the pirate. It's like giving ourselves permission to return to what we love. And I can promise you, you'll create out of that place. Oh my God. I'm going to play this show to myself <laughs> over and over. like every week I'm going to do that. Can I have that PDF by the way? I'd love to do that. Yes. Um, uh, well, that's just, oh gosh, so powerful. And it's, uh, and you know, it, it's like you said, it's, it's sometimes 
we're so, and I, I don't know if it's like a New York thing too, but you know, we're so into the work and the, uh, how many, you know, th things can we do and how many paychecks can we make? And, and, you know, that you just get so lost in the sauce that you just forget exactly why you wanted to do what you were doing in the first place. Exactly. So um, the, the, I, I have to say for, with COVID, the not performing live. Yeah. Uh, and, and for the first few months, I wasn't really zooming that much, you know, that sort of came afterwards. Um, I missed it and it made me appreciate it more, you know, just yeah. like anything else when you lose it. Yeah. And, uh, I'm definitely coming back with a better sense and a better appreciation and a better appreciation for the, the gift, you know, that God gave me to be able yeah. to do this, that I, I worked hard at, of course, but. I was able, I, so I, but I do it and deliver and, you know, for the most, I'm not blowing my own horn, but uh, you know, when you start out, you bomb a lot. And then as the years go on, you just bomb less, you know? And I love not, that. I think that's and, brilliant. And not that I'm never going to bomb again, uh, sure. but, uh, and, and also when you're more seasoned, you can get yourself you know, out of the bombing, you know, if that if right. you start to go there, you can kind of pull yourself out. But, but, you know, my, my shows are, are, you know, consistently funny. I give people what I want. I also just sort of, um, you know, redirected the energy. Uh, you know, it's about, it's, you, you know, I'm performing a service. I mean, it's about them. Yes. And, and, and that's why when somebody hires me and I'm like, you tell me what you want. You want it a little spicy? You want it a you want it squeaky clean? You don't even want me to say crap. I mean, you know, whatever you want, you just tell me and I'll do it. And um, and and then you know maybe grateful for the work because the work was taken away. And then when it comes back, it's like oh, this is well, also nice. Ellen, <laughs> comedy. What you do is one of the greatest gifts you could give people right now. It's like to be able to laugh in the face of everything that's going on. It's just like, it goes even beyond a service. It is feeding people's souls on the deepest level to be able to laugh and go, oh, right, we can breathe, we can laugh. It's such a gift. And however you do it, whether I met you on Zoom, I've never met you in person and I've never seen a live show and you made me laugh so hard. And I was like, I love this woman. so. I'm grateful that you're doing it under any circumstance. Thank you. And I love the, the group. Let's just, I want the, the group. And then I want to make sure we cover your short film, uh, the group that you and Sue, was there another woman that was involved? There's a whole group of us. It's not okay. just me and Sue. Ilan, okay. I mean, there's a small group right. that, and we all actually, what we share is we're Arbonne sisters, but it's not a group for Arbonne. People right. don't have to use it or buy Arbonne to be in the group, but it was, these are really visionary women. Alana is a Grammy award-winning opera singer. And, you know, it's like really diverse women who said, you know what? We feel like we're just getting started and we have no intention of being over 50. And, you know, it's like now we get to start this juicy story and we get to play. So that's what the group's for. And and that was my, uh, my other, my point too, was um, just the whole we talk about a lot of isms. We don't talk enough about ageism. Oh, and, please. Thank you and, very much. And, you know, people, people are living longer, taking better care of themselves. I'm not saying everybody, but you know, overall it's, you know, it, it's a different environment. People want to work longer. I mean, you know, 65 isn't like, who came up with that? You know what I mean? Why is that? Or 60 or 55, you know, like, where is that age? Like I've seen signs, senior citizen discount for anybody 55 and over. It's like, when did that, when, when did that, <laughs> I know, bar, I know. when did that bar get lowered? Or when, you know, remember when COVID <laughs> first came out and they were talking about seniors and they go 55. I'm like, well, I'm sorry. Was <laughs> Did I miss the memo? I mean, I was just so ridiculous. You know, the L I even hate the word like elderly. And I just hate it. I, I, I hate it all because it's, there's a derogatory message uh, yeah. to it. And I was very blessed that I knew all of my grandparents except one. And I knew my great grandmother. And I had a lot of people in my life live till a very ripe old age. And when I tell you sharp as a tack, yeah. okay, not miss a beat, 
Yeah. I mean, so, you know, I can't stand this. Oh, I, I, I even, know, I mean, listen, I'm, I'm a comedian, so I could take the joke, but when people make an, oh, I'm getting old, you know, I, you know, oh, I can't remember I'm getting old. I, it's, it's, it really is very negative talk. I mean, oh, you yeah. gotta take care. Look, if you think you're going to smoke two packs of cigarettes a day and drink bourbon, and you think you're going to be okay by the time you <laughs> say, you no, know, probably not. Your lungs are shot, your liver is shot and all your good cells are gone. So exactly. you know, I mean, exactly. I, you know, you have to do a little bit of, of work and self-maintenance. Uh, but, uh, you know, let's say that you do, I mean, I just don't understand this stop working and I mean, unless you want to, of course, but there's so much, and, uh, I've gotten, there's been a couple of, uh, actually my cousin, one was my cousin and one was a friend of mine and they're both, you know, not 20 and, uh, and they were, they work, they're smart, they're hard worker. They don't miss a beat. They don't miss a step, nothing, you know? And they, and, and I mean, and honestly, you know, physically you would never know, you know, from appearance wise, you would never know. Uh, okay. and, um, one told me a story of she's had been at a company for 30 years and that the new boss said something about, well, shouldn't you be winding it down? <gasps> oh, no, 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 no. And it no. was just, dis- me, she's a top producer. I mean, just, it was so disgust. It was, I was I, I, like, it was like getting assaulted. It was disgusting. And, you know, and she was like, I'm not planning on going anywhere. Um, and, you know, and, and, oh, and you really shouldn't be asking me that, but, you know, aside from the fact that you just did. And then, Another one is, um, my, I said my cousin, but anyway, it was actually something, uh, something I won't get, I, I, I'll say it to you off air, I just don't want to say it here, but you know, it was something that she created and somebody on the board said, you know, shouldn't you be thinking about a, su- a su- su- succession, succession plans and, you know, like wind, again, winding it down. And she's like, uh, she's like, you know, my father went to court till he was 95 and he got paid for it. I'm not, you know, exactly. I'm not going. Here. So it's really disgusting and and believe me i'm not like i love men so it's not a man hater thing but it just but you know i gotta call it as it is it seems to happen more for women than it does for men i don't know why it just does and 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 women and men are both the perpetrators of that you know what i mean it's not just like men saying it's a women i mean women will say it's other women because 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 those two examples that I gave you came from other women. So yeah. uh, uh, I, I can't stand it. I, I can't, I, I, it just blows my mind. Who are you to say that, you know? I mean, if listen, if someone's doing a lousy job, they're doing a lousy job, but that's not the case. So I love what you guys are doing, the inspiring, the, and, and by the way, there should be a premium paid to people that have a 20, 30, 40 years experience. Thank you if, very much, if, yeah. If, we are smarter. I, I'm just let, I, I, I'm just letting you know that we are smarter. And you know what? I feel sorry for the twenty somethings. Okay, mm-hmm. because their generation again, you know, what I see, what I hear, and everything, they can't handle it. They have anxiety. They need a day off. This and that. Listen, I, I had seventy thousand anxiety attacks going to the accounting firm. You know what I did? I blew in a paper bag and I went to the office. That's what I did. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I had aromatherapy in my purse. I'd smell it. And I went upstairs to the 17th floor and I sat my ass down in front of my calculator. So fuck it up. You know, I mean, it's like, like stop being so weak. So <laughs> That has to be a moment in your show someday. <laughs> so, so I'm really glad that you uh, all created that. Um, you know, uh, your story, Sue's story. I mean, well, Sue started her business when she was 58. Yeah. She's like, she's built, I'm not allowed to say how much, but I will say she's a member of the Arbon Million Dollar Earner Club or the Million Dollar Club. But the point is she had a vision. She recreated her life. She was 58. And it's like, here's great news. There right now, 529,000 people in the world over the age of 100. Mm. 92,000 of them are in the United States and they are running marathons and they are doing yoga classes. There's a 108 year old man who finished a marathon. 
and it's and they're getting married and they're falling in love and they're gardening and it's really there's never been a better time honestly to be a woman and to be our age or beyond because the 80s are the new 60s and the 60s are the new 40s and the rules that used to be like okay well i guess i should put on my sweater and just serve cookies to the kids and rock in my chair it's like oh no we feel like we're just literally just getting started. I just turned 65 and I was like, that number. And there was social and Medicare. I was like, I don't want Medicare. My mother had Medicare. I don't need, you know, but then I went, okay, here's what I'm going to do at 65. I'm going to retire from doing anything I don't want to do anymore. Mm. that's my retirement plan oh i like that i'm gonna do all things that i really am excited about doing and my plan is that i'm going to grow and when i say younger i don't mean pasting and cutting and but i mean in my spirit grow younger and feel more beautiful with every year that goes by mm -hmm. and i know it's possible because so much of it is what we believe so if we're like oh i'm old i was old uh, 25 pounds ago, <laughs> mm -hmm. I was really old mm -hmm. and I was achy and I was like polluting myself. And I was like, Oh, I'm so old. And then I went on this like plant-based diet and I started doing Qigong. And I went, I'm not old now. How did that happen? It has nothing to do with years. It has to do with how, what we say to ourselves, how we take care of ourselves, the kind of love that we practice toward ourselves and others we can become like kids and I'm not just blowing smoke on that, but it takes work. It doesn't just happen by eating Oreos in your sweatpants. Right. And then, uh, well, once I get cool sculpting, I'll feel a little bit younger, but um, I've looked at cool sculpting. I've looked at that. Uh, you did a short film that I got to see hmm. uh, the face or face the face. It's the face, but if you want to see it, you have to Google on YouTube, the face, a film by Elizabeth Browning. Because if you just put in the face, all kinds of God awful things come up. It's like, <laughs> she made that? Oh, dear. She didn't sound like that. And it was, uh, it was so on point. Mm. Uh, so on point. And uh, so I, I want people to just just watch it. It's, it was very interesting. It was very well done. You were fabulous, of course. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and it, it, it sends a really good message. It really does in this day and age of uh, everything is aesthetics, everything is looks. Um, it breaks my heart to see young girls. Oh my God putting things in their face. I've done nothing in that regard. I mean, I've gotten facials and, you know, that kind of stuff, but I've done none of, as you can tell, I've done none of that. Doesn't mean I've never thought about it. Uh, and it was, so, so it was something in that, in your film that really resonated with me, but I, it, it was also about just putting that stuff in my body because yeah. there, there are horror stories and oh, yeah. not everybody looks refreshed and, and all that, oh, which it was sort of yeah. like what you were making. Um, and then, you know, and I, and now I'm just like, 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 why? Like, why can't, like, I can't, I'm not heinous. I mean, you know, it's fine. It's like, it just, it's like, you're beautiful. <laughs> no, that's the tagline for the film. It's a, what if we were really beautiful and we didn't know it? Mm -hmm. And I think that there's like a billion dollar advertising machine that would lead us to believe that whatever we are, that's not good. But if you buy this, or if you have this done, then right. we can suddenly become what we're supposed to be. But like, what if we actually were exquisitely beautiful at every age, that all of this was a part of what was supposed to happen and that we've just been brainwashed right. into looking at things as a problem, like, oh, this is a problem that, you know, and, and it's not to say that I don't stand in front of them and go, well, maybe if right. we just pulled this up a little bit here, but didn't do anything else. You know, but because we've we're affected, we're affected by the images. Yeah, and I do think that our our grandmothers certainly, um, you know, and 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 prior to that, did not experience that. And those women 
Um, cause I, you know, cause again, I, I was lucky enough to know both my grandmothers very well and my great grandmother, it was, it was, first of all, none of that stuff was around, but they, and, but they were conscientious of their appearance. They went, their hair was, when they went out, they wore their dress, they had their earrings, they put their lipstick, they, their hair was, you know, done, whatever. I mean, they still looked beautiful. They took exactly. care of it. It wasn't like they went out, you know, like a rag, um, but they didn't, it didn't, that wasn't part of it. It didn't matter. You know what I'm saying? You know, they, but they always looked nice. They always looked, you know, church ready. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I loved it. I love I loved your film. I, you. I could talk to you forever. I, I, I know, love, I know. This is awesome. Give us your website and all of your social media. And I want people to follow you and see the film. And, and if they want to take a class or have some coaching with you. I think it, a, a great idea. You're very inspirational. Your your new show, is it like a YouTube? It's a YouTube, right? It's on YouTube, yeah. Zoom. It's on Zoom, YouTube. Everything's on Zoom right now. So right. Uh, it's Inspiring Life with Elizabeth, and that's on YouTube. And they, there are some great episodes of people that are, are leading exercises. It's like a really good place if you want to like get a boost in your spirit from any number of directions. Uh, my website is elizabethbrowning.com, E-L-I-Z-A-B-E-T-H-B-R-O-W-N-I-N-G.com. On Facebook, I'm Elizabeth Browning. Uh, I'm pretty much Elizabeth Browning. If, if you can't find me, Elizabeth Browning, just put in Elizabeth Browning NYC and then I will pop up. So this has been the most fun. You have such a fun, wonderful show. And thank you. Thank you for opening a space where we can literally talk about anything. I've loved it. Thank you. And thanks for doing it. Thanks for taking the time. I know that you're super, super busy. Um, I am Ellen Karras. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Greek Chick Comic. Ellen Karras, Greek Goddess of Comedy on Facebook. EllenKarras.com is my website, E-L-L-E-N-K-A-R-I-S, where you can find this show and all the other ones that I've done for the past six seasons. Uh, thank you, everybody. I thank Elizabeth. It's been great. Listen, just listen. Just be a good person. That's not so difficult. Okay, trust me on this. And uh, until next time, thank you so much. Bye.